What is going on, everybody? Liam Mitchell back with another video. Super excited to be here today with my friend Chuck Fonchell. Chuck, how you doing? It is a beautiful, beautiful day. Actually, well, we got like about 78 as a high in Tampa. So that, that's not bad for an October Saturday. I love it, man. I love it. I wish I was there. I wish I was in Florida. Hey, I, I'd love to check out L.A. I, I don't know about lockdown L.A., but uh, it, it, there's a certain mystique about the City of Angels. Yeah, it's getting uh, – the bars just started opening up, I think, around here. So maybe next – maybe this – maybe tonight or next weekend I'll start going out and getting – getting back out there hopefully i know my restaurant that i work at is opening back up inside so well that is very exciting uh, an extra stream of revenue is never a bad thing we uh, our governor has declared that corona is over so we have we have no restrictions you know, on anything I'm anymore i'm pretty sure the dolphins they said they could have max capacity in their stadium is that true yeah well, you've got, you've got Dan Mullen, the head coach of the Gators, last week. He was like, well, I hope there's 90,000 people in the swamp. And his, uh, his athletic director immediately said, we are going to do whatever the CDC tells us. <laughs> Love it. We'll see what happens for the Super Bowl at Raymond James. All right, man. All right. Anyway, we're going to be talking a little Bucks bears and then going into the uh, Bucks packers game tomorrow. So I kind of came on already, did a little recap of – of the Bucks bears game was pretty frustrated with the officiating, but as well, the O-line didn't play great. And it's going to be good to see Chris Godwin getting back this week. So first and foremost, what were your thoughts on the Bucks bears game? Bucks bears game was a little bit mystifying because as you watched that football game, it, no ma almost no matter what point you tuned in, you probably saw a team that the Buccaneers were in control of. They, they started out very well in offense. They dominated play in the third quarter. Really, if you take out the last two minutes of either half, the Bucs win that game. They lost by one point despite a whole litany of things going against them. When you talk about the offensive line penalties that you've already referenced, you talk about some questionable defensive penalties that were called on the Bucs. Um, when you talk about a, an injury at the end of the game to one of our best pass rushing defensive linemen, uh, when you talk about not having a, a lot of their great offensive weapons, they lose by one point, and it, it feels like such a tragedy because it's a game that they had in hand. So for them to, to drop it, it it's frustrating. Uh, and yet also, I feel somewhat positive in that despite all these things going wrong, it was still a game the Bucks very easily could have won. And I think that that speaks to their ability to continue to win games moving forward. Absolutely. Exactly what you just said. You know, it was a, it was a frustrating loss. I thought we were the better team on Thursday. Frankly, I thought we – we probably played a little bit better than the Bears, but sometimes that's how things go. And it's just funny how the NFL works when it comes to, like, close games. And if you ask me, I think the one in four Chargers are just as good as the four and one Bears, if not better. I'm willing to make that statement. Um, but the well, Chargers, I think they're, they're better, better at quarterback, that's for sure. Just, yeah. Justin Herbert looks like the real deal. Oh, man. he's So it's just funny how the cookie crumbles when it comes to close games. I, I just saw a stat yesterday that Seattle is – over the past couple of years, I think Seattle is 14 and two in single score games and the Chargers are three and 13. It's just like, man, well, that's, teams can't win close games. The Bucks. That's what happens that. when you let Russ cook. Yep. When you let Russ cook. All right, man. Well, let's not talk too much about the loss. We're looking forward. Bucks Packers tomorrow. Massive game. Woo! Uh, America's game of the week on Fox yet again. Joe Buck Twake. I'm going to be announcing the Bucks. uh, third time this year that's not very often we see that well hopefully that this is a better result because they called the uh, the saints game and they called the bears game and we are over two in games that uh that joe buck and troy aikman have called so maybe maybe we can switch that up as they finally get to raymond james stadium for the first time in 2020 yeah let's hope man it's uh it's gonna be a big game tom brady aaron Rodgers. what are your uh what's the biggest matchup of this game what do you think the keys to winning are what do you? Uh... I would say uh, it's going to come. I'm going to give you some defensive uh, uh, player names here. I'm going to say uh, Jair Alexander. I'm going to say Carlton Davis. And then I'm going to say Zadarius Smith. And I am going to say Shaq Barrett. So you've got two outside linebackers and two number one cornerbacks. Uh, whichever team has their player perform well out of those matchups is probably going to win the game because you've got two offenses that should be able to experience an elite output. 
You've got uh, quarterbacks near the top of their game. Uh, I believe the Bucks probably have the better skill position group, although the Packers have an argument to make there. Uh, both defenses have played well, statistically speaking. Um, the Bucks, you know, they're, they're missing their big run stuffer. The Bucks have, or forgive me, the Packers, they have Kenny Clark. And he's probably, if you put him and Vita Vea together in a vacuum, they're about as close to a skill set match as you're going to find. So for the Bucks to lose Vita Vea, that hurts, especially against a Packer offense uh, that's able to run the ball with Aaron Jones having like nearly six yards of carry, Jamal Williams doing very well. I, I think he's 13 for 13 on target to receptions. Um, so if, uh, if, if your cornerback can shut down the best wide receiving option, if your outside linebacker can get home and put the other quarterback on the ground, you're probably going to win the game. Which team gets that result? We'll see. Absolutely. You know, Devontae Adams back this week for the Packers. Uh, you know, I think Carlton Davis has been doing a great job this season. So hopefully he can keep it going. And, yeah, that was going to be another one of my questions for you. With the loss of Vita, who was actually right behind me still for the month of I, I saw him there. I saw him. Yeah. He um, makes my heart sad. Do you think you will see a, a pretty big pretty big difference in the rushing defense going forward? Or do you think you think we'll be all right? You think guys like Nacho will step up and the linebackers will still be able to step in? You, or do you think you see a bit of a decline in how good this rush defense has been? I, I believe that we still have the personnel to be able to stop the run. I don't believe we're going to be able to do it in as dominant a sense. Vita Vea is a man among boys. You're talking about 347 pounds of athletic mountain. And, and you've seen that. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, what you've also seen is him continue to develop as a pass rusher over the last couple of seasons. So to lose him in the middle, you just can't replace him. Uh, you, can, you can certainly, you can get some of the contribution from Nacho, from uh, Raheem Nunez Rochez. He was talked about all camp long. He put on some meat. He put on some muscle. Um, he's a guy that does have some quickness to him. He could be a penetrator. Uh, and he can certainly eat up some blocks. Um, but it, it's tough to ask him to replace a guy that you drafted 12th overall, um, you know, back in 2018. So we're going to find out exactly what can happen there. Um, you still got William Golston, who is an elite run defender. You still got uh, Indomitian Sue, who is, uh, you know, possibly a fringe Hall of Famer at this point. Um, we'll see what we can get out of JPP. He's a guy that plays the run very well. You've got two great run stuffing linebackers and Levante David and uh, Devin White. So, uh, we're going to see the the Packers offensive line is good. They've always, they're usually pretty good. Aaron Rodgers will take sacks over the course of his career because he likes to hold on to the ball and let plays develop, not usually because they're surrendering pressure from four rushers. So um, again, it's a wait and see sort of thing. I think this is a game the Bucks can win. I, I just don't think it's, I wouldn't bet on it, but I'm certainly going to cross my fingers and hope. Yeah, it's, it's obviously going to be a tough game. Green Bay's 4-0. They look like Super Bowl contenders. But I do think the Bucs can be just as good. You know, you never doubt Tom Brady. And we've got a ton of talent. So one of my bold predictions for this game, we are going to intercept Aaron Rodgers. He has not thrown an interception all season. 13-0 to 0 ratio. Let's hope we can get some takeaways, man. Uh, do you think we can get some takeaways on this, man? I, I would say that the best shot for an interception is going to be a defensive lineman putting a hand up and tipping a ball in the air. Brady um, and Rodgers both are guys that typically don't throw a lot of interceptions. Um, and uh, for Rodgers to be 13 against O right now is a mark that's very, very impressive. But he's due. You know, he's never going – very few people go an entire season without one. And, uh, and I think that uh, – I think this is week is as good as any. Uh, Carlton Davis was an injury concern um, uh, over practice. He, he came out of the Bears game okay, uh, but then apparently he had some injury come up in practice. Uh, if he's good to go, and I think he's going to be a game-time decision, according to Coach Arians, uh, we saw in the Chicago game, and I, I wrote this up in the review, that it was good to see Jamel Dean making plays. That bodes well. Um, uh, Sean Murphy bunting came up lame in the Broncos game and it, it kind of showed up a little bit against the chargers. Um, hopefully an extra, you know, a couple of days of rest has him feeling well. We've got a secondary that I think stacks up pretty well against green bays. You know, they've got Kevin King, they've got Jair Alexander, but 
I mean, if you're talking about skill position against defensive players, the Bucs probably have an edge. Um, difference is Aaron Rodgers is a little bit more mobile, and I trust Green Bay's offensive line more than I trust the Bucs. Absolutely. You know, it's funny you say that because I was on a, a stream just like this uh, yesterday with the Packers guy from FTFN, Bass, and he said the exact same thing. I said, can the Bucs get some interceptions off of him? And he said, well, Aaron Rodgers doesn't really throw interceptions. If they're going to get an interception, it's going to be because of a deflected pass. So, you know, if, funnily enough, history says, because, uh, of course, I love my history, the Bucs have been fairly good at intercepting Aaron Rodgers. They picked him off three times, both times, uh, in our first couple of matchups against him in 08 and 09. And yep. then Albert Mack actually had another one in the 2011 game in Green Bay. So, you know what? I'm hoping time – what's the word I'm looking for? Reboots itself and, and we can get yes. it tomorrow. So We'll yeah. see. Uh, you know, Aaron, Aaron Rodgers, he's typically a good decision maker, but, but he does have a bit of a gambler to him as well. He trusts his, his receivers to make plays. And he will, from time to time, give them a 50-50 ball and say, go make a play. Uh, we have big cornerbacks. You know, Carlton Davis is six feet tall. Jamel Dean is nearly six feet tall. Um, Sean Murphy Bunting isn't short. I believe he's about 5'11". Uh, so we have guys that can contend and make plays. Uh, if they're able to get their hips turned and their, their eyes on the football, there will be plays to be made. Um, unfortunately, a side effect of that, given the fact that Rodgers will give his guys chances to make plays, he's smart. And if he sees a defensive back with his back facing him, he'll just put a ball out there and hopefully get a, a defensive pass interference. And we, we saw that a little bit. We'll see that from time to time with Carlton Davis. He's a handsy corner. Um, you know, smart quarterbacks can make those plays happen. So hopefully the Bucs can get out of their own way and we won't see 11 penalties for 110 yards like we saw against Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. You know, interesting stat I saw and this in Bass with fan to fan said, well, it's because the, the Packers were shredding them of the four Packers opponents so far this season. They have faced the one in four Vikings who have the 27th ranked defense, the one in three Lions who have the 29th ranked defense, the three and two Saints who have the 26th ranked defense and the 0 and five Falcons who have the 30th ranked defense. So, yes, the Packers shredded them up. Maybe that's why they're so low in terms of yards and stuff. But they haven't really played any defenses. I do think the Bucs are the best defense they'll be facing. So it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, again, I do, I'm a Bucs fan. I don't want to count the Bucs out. Yeah. We've said for years, as soon as the Bucs stop beating themselves, they will stack up some wins. Is this the week that happens? We're coming off a mini buy. So they've had time to rest up. They've had time to heal up. They've had time to coach up. Uh, Coach Arians after the Bears game says that we got outplayed and we got out coached. If we get out coached on Sunday, the Buccaneers will lose. Uh, if we keep kicking field goals on fourth and one from the seven yard line, um, if we keep playing soft off coverage, uh, you know, if we keep running the ball uh, on first down, even though it's constantly resulting in one and two yard carries, then we won't be satisfied with the result. Um, I would love to see more first down play action. I would love to see more first down spread and then run the football in second and four. Uh, the, the Packers play the run very, very well. Uh, you know, we mentioned Kenny Clark. We mentioned uh, uh, Zadaria Smith. We could talk about uh, Christian uh, Kirksey. They, they've got some run stuffers on that team. The Buccaneers have the talent on paper to be able to win this football game. Can they get out of their own way and do it? That's what we're tuning in for at 4 o'clock. Absolutely. I got another question for you. What do you think of the running backs? Rojo's looked good the past couple of weeks, over 100 yards. I know he's struggled with his drops. And what do you, what do you, How do you think this running this backfield will look going forward with, with how Rojo's been playing? Are they still going to split touches with Fournette? I mean, it's, it's interesting. I have been high on Ronald Jones since he was drafted. And it makes me laugh when people talk about his disastrous rookie season. Because if you do a cut up of every carry he had in his rookie season, I think he had 25 or 30 carries. A lot. On literally half of those, he was being hit in the backfield decisively. He had no shot. We couldn't run block worth a damn. Um, in his second season, you started to see that evolve. And now here we are five games into his third season 
and he's he, he looks pretty serviceable as a running back. Um, the hands are still a question mark. He, he, he can pull his eyes up and try and uh, run before he catches the ball. But with the ball in his hands, he can create things as a pass receiver. I like Ronald Jones, and I think he should be the number one running back. Uh, Leonard Fournette is a known quantity. He can run you over. He can get one yard, even if he has to run into the back of his own guy to do it. But he's not a creator as a pass catcher. Um, he doesn't have, I think, as much make you miss as Ronald Jones has. Um, LaShawn McCoy, I, I'm not a big shady guy. Uh, I think he, there, there was one time in his career when he was absolutely elite. But he's, he's on the wrong side of 30 now. Yeah. And those quick twitch muscles just fade with age. Yeah. And he, he's... I don't mind having him on the roster, but I would definitely see, prefer to see a healthy Keyshawn Vaughn over LaShawn McCoy. Whoever Tom Brady is handing the football off to on Sunday, I, I think so long as it's a good situation, so long as we have numbers in the box to defend it, I'm excited to see what happens. Yeah, I, you know, I'll always be one to eat my words. And, you know, I, to be honest, I was not a big Rojo fan. I was one of those naysayers his rookie year, and I, I didn't see it, but – you know what? I'm always happy to eat my words, and I think it's really good to see him. I think he's looked great these past couple of weeks. So I, I thought I saw a little bit of that last year, too. So, you know, I, I think it's awesome. Like Bruce said, you can never have enough good running backs. So, yeah. He man. does love running backs. He, he loves to run the football. And, and running the football obviously has its advantages. You can't throw an interception when you run the football. Um, but it's a lot easier to throw a 40-yard pass completion than it is to get a 40-yard run. You know, and, and you'll have guys uh, here in the Tampa Bay media. Um, we had uh, Tom Bassinger with the uh, Tampa Bay Times, and he was a big numbers guy. I think he's recently moved up to Philadelphia. But he would always tweet and post about just the numbers favoring just pass, pass, pass. You know, from a football standpoint, uh, you do like the opportunity. If you can get five yards of carry and never have to throw the football, it's actually a comfortable way to win. It's very frustrating and demoralizing for your opponents. But uh, against a quarterback like Aaron Rodgers and, you know, with Chris Godwin coming back, with hopefully a healthy Justin Watson and uh, a healthy Scotty Miller, if, if he's continued to heal that groin, um, and with an emerging Tyler Johnson to go along with the always dependable Mike Evans, who hopefully has a, a better feeling ankle, he, I, I would want, I would hope that they let Tom Brady throw the football. I, I would not complain about maybe a, a 40 to 20 pass run split. I think that's probably going to be the best way to attack the Packers. You know, I always laugh because my dad, he's so old school. He's like, oh, man, if I was a coach nowadays, man, I'm bringing in the three tight end set. I'm just running down their throats, man. I'm running 70% of the time. Like, that. this is not the 70s. That's not, that's not how it works. You know, it's not, but when the Bucks had O.J. Howard, they were kind of effective out of a three tight end set. Yeah. You know, when you've got Gronk and O.J. Howard as potential pass receivers coming out of that, you don't feel as bad about sacrificing a wide receiver. You've still got your run pass option there. Um, but now suddenly when you're throwing out Rob, uh, Rob Gronkowski with such guys as Cameron Brait and Tanner Hudson – the running game isn't as much of a threat there. These, these are not natural run blockers. Um, I, I do think that Tanner Hudson could do things in the pass game. He was open for a potential touchdown uh, against Chicago in the first quarter. Tom Brady got hit as he got ready to throw the football. But I, when he's on the field, I don't think the Packers are going to have to worry too much about the run because uh, – he is definitely a liability in the run blocking game. You, you might be able to be just as effective in the pads yeah. as Tanner Hudson when yeah. it comes to a handoffs. He's pretty much a receiver. Yeah. Uh, second bold prediction for this game, though, I just have a feeling Rob Gronk is getting in the end zone this week. Is it going to happen? I mean, we don't know for sure. I want to see the guy score. This is the week. I, had, I just got this feeling. There's an aura around it. It's happening. It's, it's been a long time since the Packers have had a linebacking crew that, that you expected to make plays in the passing game. They, they, they can play the run pretty well. They lost Blake Martinez in the offseason. Um, you know, they, they've got decent safety play in Green Bay, but the tight ends are absolutely going to be a part of this game plan, especially when you've got some cornerbacks out of Green Bay that are going to be paying special attention to the wide receivers that we've already talked about. I predicted Gronk would catch a touchdown last week. You've seen him steadily the last two, three weeks really get involved in the passing game. It feels like he's got his legs under him. Uh, he has been dealing with the shoulder, but he was a full participant in practice this week. So, he, you know, it looks like he's just 
just soldiering on and I'm, I'm ready for a Gronk spike. I'm ready yeah. for a Gronk spike. I, I've been practicing out in the field by my house. Uh, I look very silly doing it, but he looks majestic. He's made a couple of great catches the past couple of weeks. That big one against uh, the Chargers, and then he made a great catch in the red zone. Tom really rifled it in. It was that play. It fell a couple of yards shy of a first down, unfortunately. And that's that fourth down we've been talking about where they, you know, it went from fourth and 17 to, or third and 17 to fourth and like a short two long one. And they, they chose the field goal to take the lead late in the fourth quarter. Um, this would be a great week for Rob Gronkowski to get on the board with that, uh, especially when uh, when Green Bay's got the, their their tight end that they're pretty excited about. Kind of came out of nowhere, and yeah. and he he managed to get three touchdowns just a couple of weeks ago. Um, goodness, I'll tell what, you, uh, what, what, I'll tell you what about Tanyan. This is just a little Robert me. Tanyan, yes, yeah, a little me story. My fantasy football league with all my friends, I was playing my buddy Mike. He had Devontae Adams. And it, right before game time, he's like, oh, great. He's not playing. So he benched him. He picked up Tanyan probably 10 minutes before the game. The guy ends up getting him 98 yards, three touchdowns. I think I won by like two points. I was sweating. I was like, if this guy, Robert Tanyan. Well, beat- I'd say, you know, I, I was bracing for you to talk about how mad you were that you lost. So <laughs> no, I ended up winning. For you to come up with a two-point win there, that's pretty good. I would have lost my mind if uh, – <laughs> I'm very competitive with my friends in fantasy football, so. But anyway, the last it's thing – It's not I want, fun if you're not. Yeah, the last thing I wanted to ask you before we wrap this up, going back to last week, what do you think of the officiator? What did you think of that roughing the passer on Shaq Barry on that third and 19? Did you think it was a justified penalty? Did you – No, yeah. obviously not. I, I think it sucked. Um Again, there there's the school of thought that winners don't complain about the officiating, and 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 absolutely, I think was the wrong call. Uh, the you know the the announcer said so, and and you know you've heard multiple national pundits say the same thing, but you're seeing that now, and and somebody tweeted that it's kind of hypocritical for Bucks fans right now to complain because the guy on our sideline is why that's getting called. Um, officiating has changed so much to protect the quarterback. Uh, and, and a lot of that has to do with Tom Brady. Um, you know, the NFL has an interest in making sure that quarterback play stays as strong as possible. Better quarterback play leads to better ratings. People don't want to watch 40 carries and 16 to 13 outcomes. Uh, in, in fact, I think it, it might wind up being the case that you see ratings continue to rise throughout the season just because of the better offensive play we've seen and that there are less fans in stadiums so road teams can perform better on offense too. Um, Against Aaron Rodgers, you might see a similar call. Um, And it it stinks, but there were a lot of different things that the Bucs did to shoot themselves in the foot where if they had changed even one of those, we might not be worried about that penalty because they would have won anyway. Yeah, I mean the false starts on the offensive line, all these holding call, all these holding penalties. We're one of the highest penalized teams in the NFL, and just like takeaways and turnovers, you you got to cut down on those penalties because you're just constantly shooting yourself in the foot, and it it doesn't help you win games. That's for sure. Tom was boy, was he ripping into him on the sidelines last week, and I think he and did, uh, well deserved. You, I'm I'm sure that you you might have heard of a, a beat writer. Uh, named Greg Alman, who works for the uh, the Athletic, he used to be with the Tampa Bay Times. He covers the Bucks, and he brought up a, a statistic uh, on stalled drives. So this is uh, penalties that just stop an offensive drive. Uh, and good teams on that list might have three or four or five drives that have been stalled by penalty through five weeks. I think the Packers might have four. The Buccaneers have 15. They're averaging three drives per game that just get snuffed out by a penalty. Uh, it can be a holding. It can be a, an unnecessary roughness. It can be an unsportsmanlike penalty. Uh, it can be a, a false start. We saw Donovan Smith get two in the same yeah. drive this past week. I feel you know, this is I feel this. Yeah, they it's and false and. Uh, Tom Brady is definitely not used to that. You know, obviously in New England, they typically had one of the uh, most well-disciplined teams. And 
you know, Bruce Arians, I don't think Bruce Arians is at fault for the lack of discipline. I think that there are just some players that we have that haven't developed in their technique. Uh, our $14 million left tackle is probably cheap on that list. Um, you're going to go through your growing pains with a guy like Tristan Wirfs on his rookie year. Um, Alex Kappa is a guy that they're, you know, they drafted him late in the, in the draft and they're hoping that he can develop. Um, you definitely hate seeing it out of a guy like Ryan Jensen, who's supposed to be a leader on this offensive line. And you like his tenacious attitude. You like that he stands up for his teammates. But if he's going to go around knocking helmets and drawing 15-yard flags, it's going to be really hard to win. That one drive that, that launched Brady into, uh, into La La Land from an anger standpoint, if we score a field goal there, we win the football game. You know, we were at, I think, the 30-yard line, and suddenly, before you know it, we're back at the 50, and we don't score. That's yeah. the ball game. What was it, like third and 31 or something ridiculous? Like oh. Second and 20, and then it was second and 27. Well, I think we took a sack, and then there was a holding, and then we got yardage on a screen pass, but that got called back. And then we got another one. Well, we got a deep pass to Evans that fell incomplete, but even if it had been complete, Alex Kappa held. So it was a rough, rough series. Yeah, it was a rough one. Let's hope we uh, aren't committing so many self-inflicting penalties on Sunday tomorrow. I'm super excited for the game. As always, Chuck, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for coming on. We'll definitely be doing more of these. Uh, love your new backdrop. Looks awesome. Hopefully the Rays can finish off the Astros. and get Please, God. <laughs> Please, God, can we just get a couple bloops to fall tonight? <laughs> All right, guys, thank you guys so much for watching. I will be back with another video soon, and let's get this win tomorrow. Go Bucks! Go Bucks! Take care, Liam. Thanks, man.